I'll be presenting the Section GG, uh, Functional Ability and um, Goals with Ann Deitch following. And uh, let's get started. So, you see a slide here of the acronyms, and we've provided you with a sheet um, that uh, does um, provide you with all these acronyms. So, we won't go through these. Uh, next, we'd like to give you a bit of an overview of what we'll be going through. We'll be explaining the intent of Section GG, Functional Abilities and Goals. And we'll be reviewing the changes uh, that were made between uh, Version 3 and Version 4 of the LTEC uh, care data set, and we'll be discussing also coding instructions for these items. We seem to be having a <laughs> slide issue. Okay, there we go. Uh, then also we'll be uh, reviewing practice uh, coding scenarios, and, and Deitch will go through that with you after uh, my presentation. And she'll also go with um, over reviewing the functional outcome measure changes in the mode mobility among patients requiring ventilation, ventilator support. So by the end of this presentation, you should be able to describe the intent of these changes that we have made for Section GG and explain uh, the clarification of item definitions uh, to your uh, staff uh, if you're doing the train, trainer mode and apply those coding instructions that you'll be learning uh, to accurately uh, code the practice scenarios and then describing the functional outcome measure change in mobility among people uh, or patients rather requiring ventilation support. So as you know, many of your patients in LTEX have self-care and mobility of uh, functional uh, de deficits and limitations and uh, most are at further risk uh, for losing functional abilities and, and, and also developing medical complications uh, due to that limited mobility. And we know in the literature that it's really important for people to get up and, and begin to do um, self-cares and mobility. So let's take a look at these changes uh, between the two data sets of version 3 and version 4. So. We've added this newly, uh, newly added code 10. We want to just talk about that. It is not attempted uh, due to environmental limitations. Uh, and it can be used in LTEC, but likely it's uh, expected to be used extremely infrequently. And that's because the reason why we added it was to standardize the cross-setting uh, measure. And we've included all the GG uh, codes um, cross-settings. Uh, that appear in the 2018 PAC QRP assessment instruments. So code 10 is used for items uh, more frequently with other settings, such as, let's say, the IRF, on the IRF pie and patient rehab facility um, patient assessment instrument, and uh, such as they have an item called car transfer, uh, so there might not be a car available or a car simulator in that setting. So for that item that's in the IRF pie, not in the LTEC care data set, um, they would be using that code 10 um, if, if they were not able to have that equipment. So that's what that's about. Um, also, we have updated uh, guidance for coding uh, sections GG0130 and 0, uh, 0170 discharge goals. Uh, now you are able in that 2018 uh, version 4 to use codes not attempted. So those are the 07, um, the 09, 10, 88. It is permissible to use those codes as discharge goals. You still only have to use a minimum of, of one in terms of the discharge goals. That still counts in terms of either self-care or disability, but we know that some clinicians like to add um, the reason why they may not have a discharge goal for that person. So we've, we've added a new skip pattern, um, and that is to the uh, uh, 
walking section. So GG0170I, walk 10 feet, uh, will have uh, a skip pattern there to address the removal of our gateway, previous gateway question for walking, which asked if the patient walked or not. So that has been removed, and so you'll go right to walk 10 feet. And we um, also uh, want to point out that if the patient cannot walk 10 feet, then you'd use one of the not attempted codes uh, for that item and then skip over the walking uh, question and go right to the wheelchair question. So that's also um, a facilitating um, less burden for you folks. And then uh, we've also uh, uh, updated for alignment purposes um, these minor changes in wording, and, and they, they are not expected to change how you code items. Uh, so for instance, the first bullet, so um, and or is added for these items specified. And then or is added on the second bullet, you can see that, uh, for the wheelchair or scooter. And then regarding the third bullet, uh, since the coding instructions refer to uh, safe performance, and since that's covering all the items, we didn't feel that it was necessary uh, to, to keep the word safely that appeared um, on some of the item definitions because it's part of the instructions, of course, we're very uh, cognizant of the fact that safety is very important. So um, let's now talk about the data set. So we added clarification, defining code 09, uh, which is not attempted during assessment, uh, and the patient did not perform the activity prior to the current illness or exacerbation or injury. So it's important to distinguish that from 88, uh, not attempted due to medical uh, conditions or safety concerns. This one has to do with the patient prior to coming to the facility, prior to the illness, they did not do that particular uh, activity, and they did not do it during the three-day assessment period. So that's an important one to, to understand. Um, and then also we've added a contact guard uh, to the definition, um, because this is uh, something that we had um, heard from uh, therapists saying that, you know, it, it, this doesn't affect coding because this is what we had um, described before, but we did. We just added it to the, the actual coding definition uh, to clarify um, that it's a part of the supervision or touching contact guard assist is often used by therapists. Okay, so let's take a look at um, the coding guidance and practice uh, scenarios. The practice scenarios will be, again, given by Ann Deitch, presented later. Um, so here is your uh, section, GG items, and you can see we've added here uh, what assessment they are assessed on, um, and uh, the prior functioning and prior uh, device use. Those are, of course, just on the admission, whereas the self-care and mobility are both on admission and planned discharge. Okay, so our first one, G0100, prior functioning, everyday activities. There's only one item in here. And um, again, this is about indoor mobility and ambulation. Item definitions remain the same here. The item rationale, as you know, this is important in terms of knowing the patient's prior functioning, uh, prior to the current illness, exacerbation, injury, because this is going to help you with um, putting together those patient treatment goals. And then, of course, the steps for assessment would be to interview the patient, the family, member if um, applicable, and then review the patient's medical records, describing the patient's prior functioning with their everyday activities. And then for the coding instructions, notice the coding definitions here, and the coding numbers are specific to this item only, so they're not the same codes you're going to be using for the other GG items. And then uh, as far as coding tips, we mentioned that you want to record the patient's usual ability to perform um, indoor mobility ambulation prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. If there's no information about that patient's ability available after you have attempted to 
inquire through the patient, through their family, through the records, then you would use code 8 unknown. Now that's different than if no one had checked into this. If no one had checked into this matter, then the, if, again, if the clinician does not attempt to gather this information, then a dash would be used and the center of uh, that CMS uh, expects that this DASH use would be a rare occurrence. Okay, and then uh, let's look at prior device use. Um, this uh, is a check all that apply. Recall, prior means prior to current illness, exacerbation, and injury. So you'll be using that guidance and checking off all that applies here. And of course, again, uh, the item rationale uh, it's important to know what they used immediately prior in terms of devices and aids. Um, again, this is going to help you with your treatment goals and the assessment, steps for assessment is pretty much the same. Interviewing the patient, family, reviewing the medical records in terms of the devices that were used. Um, and uh, here, um, we, some patients may own both a motorized wheelchair and a scooter. So um, if you see there's an and or, or we've added to motorized wheelchair or scooter. So uh, if they used both, you could check that. Um, but this is part of what the device is that you would then um, consider in terms of checking. Uh, okay, so for the GG0130 self-care items, um, again, these apply to admission and plan discharge assessments. Here's what they're going to look like in your assessment instrument. These steps for um, the assessment are for you to uh, take a look at, um, you know, a licensed clinician may assess the patient's performance. And it's, this is based on um, direct observation. Um, and you want to make sure you get the input from the patient as well as um, families report from other clinicians uh, as well and care staff during that three-day assessment period. Um, the patient should be allowed to perform activities as independently as possible as long as they're safe. So in other words, you would not want to take the information you got from another um, clinician who had perhaps hurried along a patient because they were going to be late for therapy, so they did more for that patient. Their report of the assistance that they provided may not show what the patient actually can do. So you want to be uh, aware of where you get your information, how you get your information, and making sure that you get that information um, clearly in terms of uh, making up that, uh, the, the, or bringing together all of the um, information you do bring together for coding. So the helper assistance is, if they're required for safe or poor performance, of course you want to consider how much assistance is needed for that. And note that um, an activity refers to the execution of a task or a group of tasks uh, or action by an individual. So that's what we mean by that. Okay, so activities uh, can be, as you know, completed with or without um, assistive devices, and that should not affect the coding. The patient's self-care performance varies during the assessment period. You want to report that usual status, not the patient's best, not um, their most independent, and not their most dependent. You want to get their usual performance, um, and you also want to ensure that you get it as close to the admission as possible. So refer to facility federal and state policies and procedures to determine which of your LTEC staff members can complete an assessment. And this is to be done in compliance with um, facility and federal and state requirements. So for this next area, when we're looking at the codes um, for assessing, uh, section GG0130 and GG0170, uh, you want to ensure that, again, you, you code the patient's usual performance for each of the six-point scale. So independent, remember that's uh, with no assistance whatsoever from a helper. It doesn't matter if they're using a device or not, as long as it's without any assistance whatsoever. And 05, set up or clean up. Of course, that's where the helper sets up or cleans up um, 
with the patient completing all of the activities. So in other words, that helper only assists prior or after. They should not have to be in the room. So that is when, again, you are choosing 05 setup or cleanup. For supervision 04, uh, this is um, called supervision or touching assistance, but this is where the helper provides a verbal cues and, and or touching or studying uh, and contact guard assistance as well, um, or, or instead of supervision, maybe it's contact guard assistance, uh, as the patient completes the activity. So an assistance may be provided throughout the activity or intermittently. And then for O3, partial moderate assist, uh, this is where the helper uh, provides less than half the effort. So the helper either lifts or holds or supports the trunk or limbs, but provi provides less than half the effort. And this is where it's very important for you folks to know the definitions of each item. Because within each item are a number of tasks. Knowing all the tasks that are a part of that definition is vital for you to determine was it more than half or less than half the effort. So you have to make sure you understand and teach those um, to your staff in terms of defining each of those items to better be able and accurately code. Uh, for substantial maximal assist, that is where the helper does more than half the effort. Again, this has to do with lifting or holding the trunk or limbs and providing more than half the effort. And then dependent, the helper does all the effort. The patient does none of um, the effort uh, to complete the activity uh, or there's two or more helpers that are assisting that person, and that automatically becomes dependent. Even if the patient is helping a little and there is two or more uh, helpers involved, that still would be dependent. So for looking at when the activity was not attempted, during the entire three-day assessment, and I'm emphasizing that because you have the three-day assessment well we would like for you to assess them as soon as um, possible uh, you still have that three-day assessment period to think about if something wasn't completed the first or the second day so for example during the three-day assessment period the activity may not have happened in therapy such as with oral hygiene let's say but rather than on the unit with staff so instead of going right to 07, refuse because that patient said, no, I don't want to you know, do this. I've already done this already. Um, that's when you would want to talk to other uh, of your multiple staff um, to find out how that person completed that. So um, these not attempted codes um, can be used instead of the 06 but 01 but just be sure that you have gone through and talked with staff before using them to ensure that someone else in the team has not observed and can't give you the information that you can use to assess the patient and determine the code. So 09, code 09, as you see, is not applicable, but it's not attempted and the patient did not perform the activity prior to the illness exacerbation. Uh, or injury. So that's important, right? Because um, that is different than 88, which is it was not attempted due to medical conditions uh, or safety concerns. But that's at present time. Whereas, remember, 09 is looking at their history and the present time. So that's a good way to distinguish 09 and 88 from each other. And then code 10, we've already talked about this new code. Uh, that you likely will not use very often in the LTAC setting in terms of environmental limitations. Okay, so one of the ways that you can train your staff in terms of going through how is, is it you're going to code that patient, how is it that you're going to determine what level they are, uh, would be, as we're doing here, moving through a series of questions that will help you to determine what code uh, for each of the items should be. So first you begin with, uh, does the patient complete the activity by him or herself with no assistance? And by no assistance, we need, mean no physical, no verbal, no nonverbal cueing, uh, 
and no setup and no cleanup at all. So if the patient does, uh, does, when you ask yourself, does the patient complete the activity by himself with no assistance, and you say no, then you would move on to the next question. But if you said, if they do it without any of this assistance, you would code 06 independent yes. Let's go to the next question. So if you answered no to the previous question, you would ask, does the patient need only setup or cleanup assistance from one helper? Okay, and then if the answer is yes, then you would code 05 setup or cleanup assistance. And if you answered no, then you would go on to ask the next question. So does the patient only need verbal or nonverbal cueing or touching, steadying, contact guard assistance from one helper? Any of those things, if you answered yes to that, and that's the only thing they need to complete the assessment, would be code 04, supervision or touching assistance. If it's no, then you would go ahead and ask the next question. Does the patient need physical assistance? For example, lifting or trunk support from one helper with the helper providing less than half the effort. Again, I stress the fact that you need to know what the definitions are, what are the tasks that, that together equal the activity to determine this. Okay, so if you've determined that it was that the patient only needed um, from one helper less than half the effort, then you would code 03, partial moderate assist. If it's no, then you go to the next question, which asks, does the patient need physical assistance? Again, um, the type of assistance that might be lifting or trunk support, uh, but from one helper to, um, for, in this case, more than half the effort. Again, you take those things into consideration as we talked about, code 02. And finally, if uh, it's no, then you would go to the next, which is does the helper provide all of the assist and, uh, or needs two or more helpers? Then you would say, yes, code one would be dependent. So we've gone through these um, codes of why the activity was not attempted and you can see them here in terms of how we've out, um, laid them out. Um, we've talked about the differences between 88, and we've talked about the differences between 09, and how the 09 is not attempted, and historically the patient did not perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury versus 88, which is activity was not attempted just during this assessment uh, due to medical condition or safety concerns. Okay, and then uh, some coding tips that we provided for the um, self-care as well as uh, the mobility items is that um, that three-day assessment period uh, for the admission assessment includes the day of admission and the following two days up till 1159 of that third day. And that during that assessment time frame. Some activities are expected that you would perform uh, multiple times, while there may be some others, such as um, stairs, that may not be um, happening, occurring during that, that period. Uh, make sure you code the patient's functional status based on the functional assessment that occurs soon after the patient um, is admitted, and we want to reflect, also consider the patient's baseline. Um, we want to code the patient, assess them prior to having received any benefit from therapy. So CMS anticipates that a multiple disciplinary team of clinicians is involved in assessing. We've talked about examples where you're going to be talking with various team members uh, so that you have a, a good idea in terms of all how that person functions during that period. And we um, want to make sure that you know, you know, you have that three-day assessment period, however you try to do it as close to admission, and you try to, 
to do this before therapy has begun. So to clarify your own understanding of the patient's performance of an activity, it's important to talk with uh, your staff members as well and ask those probing questions. And you want to go from general to more specific. Uh, and we also want to mention again the dash uh, is a sign indicating no information. CMS expects a dash to be a rare occurrence. And use of dashes for items necessary to calculate the quality measure may result in a 2% payment reduction to the LTEX annual payment update, the APU. So do not use a dash mistakenly if the reason was that it, uh, the item was not observed because the patient refused or was not applicable or attempted due to environmental limitations or not um, done because of medical conditions or safety. You can use the these codes rather than the dash. So ensure that you are um, talking to all staff to ensure that you're coding correctly. Um, also some usual performance tips we have on admission and planned discharge. Code the patient's usual performance. Again, using that six point um, code scale or the not attempted and do not record the patient's best or the worst performance, but the patient's usual performance and code based on the patient's performance. You would not, as I gave an example before, record the patient's assessment of a potential capacity or someone else uh, hurrying the patient along and not truly um, designate what it is that the patient's capable of or does. Um, so again, we've talked about not having to use adaptive equipment um, or not considering adaptive equipment in uh, coding independent 06 because that should not affect the code. And then also um, thinking about how, what the patient needs in terms of retrieving a device or an adaptive piece of equipment so that you use 05 setup for that item. So again, um, we want to say that uh, the, the, the patient experiences an unplanned discharge or the patient dies during the LTEX stay that the GG0130 and GG0170 items uh, are not coded. Um, so this, these section GG items will not be included on the unplanned discharge or the expired assessment. So. And I believe this ends my um, section of it, and Ann Deitch will continue with uh, the item set uh, after we have a break. I believe it's a 15-minute break that you have, and then Ann, will, uh, Ann Deitch will continue with going through each of the items, and then you'll have some practice in coding the scenarios that are given. Um, so Carol gave you a great overview of the scoring and talked about the importance of knowing the definitions and the rating scales. She gave you an idea of how to think about coding. And so we're going to now get into items and go through some uh, practice scenarios. So this is meant to be interactive and um, so hopefully it'll be a good example of how to actually apply the information that Carol shared with you. So first of all, I'm going to start off with eating. So eating. Um, as Carol mentioned, the definition has been clarified slightly. It doesn't actually change any of the coding, but we had many questions and suggestions um, about the definitions, and so we did um, add the clarification that uh, eating includes both food and liquid. And so that is the rationale for providing that additional information so that it's clear to everybody. So eating is defined as the ability to use suitable utensils to bring food and liquid to the mouth and swallow food and or liquid once the meal has been placed before the patient. Um, one thing I do want to be sure to mention as part of the definition is that, again, this is focused on bringing food to the mouth. So an individual that does not eat by mouth, uh, you would not code them. You would basically say the activity didn't occur. And this is um, actually something that's come up in questions a fair bit, and so um, something that we wanted to kind of reinforce as part of this training. So we have an example here. Um, Ms. S. does not eat or drink by mouth and relies solely on getting nutrition and liquids through tube feedings due to a recent onset stroke and swallowing disorder. 
The tube feedings are administered by the staff at this time, but the goal is that Ms. S and her two daughters will learn how to administer the tube feedings before discharge. So we're doing an assessment on admission. They are talking about expectations about administering uh, tube feedings uh, for this uh, patient. But again, for eating, we are just concerned about coding whether the person can eat by mouth. So in this case, the person can't. So do you remember when Carol talked about the different options in terms of coding? Um, activity did not occur. There are several different codes that are available. Um, so one is the patient refused. Another is the person um, does not perform the activity at the time of the assessment and did not do it prior to the current um, illness, exacerbation, or injury. And another option is that the person um, is, is too ill. And another option is related to the lack of equipment. So in this case, and by the way, in your packets, you do have these uh, scenarios listed out. So if you wanted to pull these um, example, the, the sheet out with all these scenarios, you can look at that information. And so when I turn to the next slide, you'll still have the information in front of you. So as you think about this um, patient, uh, again, the person is not able to eat or drink by mouth. And so how would you code this person? And if you can pull out your phones and uh, provide the, ans uh, the possible answers, the options are that the person needs substantial maximal assistance, or it's not applicable, or the person um, is not able to do it due to environmental limitations, or that the person has a medical condition or safety concern that does not allow them to perform the activity. Okay, so it looks like most people have responded to code eight, and I do agree with that. Uh, that is the correct response. The reason that it's not 09 is that the person had a recent onset uh, of their condition. The code nine would only be used if the person uh, basically had maybe, let's say, a stroke you know, five, 10 years ago, was not eating by mouth, and now uh, that's continuing. So code 88 was indeed the correct response. Um, so here's the rationale. And um, after the, this training is provided, um, CMS will post the answers and rationale. So you don't have this particular slide available to you right now, but it will be available um, after the training. OK, so we have another example here. So in this example, uh, Mr. E R eats and drinks by mouth, but his intake is not adequate due to a recent gastrointestinal surgery he had. He relies on partial nutrition and liquids via tube feedings. The staff administer Mr. R's tube feedings. When eating and drinking by mouth, Mr. R requires steadying assistance from a helper due to his hand tremors. So in this example, the second bullet talks about tube feedings, but we're not concerned about that when we're scoring eating. So really, the third bullet is the key issue here. So when eating and drinking, um, he requires stenning assistance from a helper due to his hand tremors. So if you remember back to uh, Carol talked about the coding um, and kind of key questions to think about. So the first question was whether he needed help. So he did need help, right? And then next question was, it, is it limited to just set up assistance from one helper? So in this case, it's more than one, uh, more than set up assistance. And then the uh, next question you might ask uh, would be whether the person required touching assistance, verbal assistance. And so here it talks about steadying assistance. So as you think about that, how would you code this particular example? So again, if you'd like to look at the example, you can look at your handout um, and the possible responses that you can enter on your phone are code four, supervision or touching assistance, code three, partial or moderate assistance, uh, code four, substantial maximal assistance, and uh, one dependent. So uh, the gentleman had tremors and the helper was basically steadying his hand. OK, so it looks like there's a bit of a split between three and four. So um, if the helper is just providing touching or steadying assistance, um, it would actually be a code four. 
if the person is actually, um, the patient requires somebody to actually help them lift their hand up, that's when you would start thinking about a, a level three or a lower. So again, in this scenario, um, as described in the rationale, the patient uh, had tremors and the helper just provided steadying assistance, and so that's coded a level four. Okay, the next um, item on the data set in the area of self-care is oral hygiene. Oral hygiene is the ability to use suitable utensils to clean teeth. And there was a clarification, just actually some rewording for alignment related to dentures. So in the 2018 data set, um, it just speaks to dentures, if applicable, the ability to insert and remove dentures into and from the mouth and manage denture soaking and rinsing with the use of equipment. Again, there's no change in actual coding between the old definition and new definition, but it was just clarified to be um, aligned with other data sets and just to put things in an order in, ter in terms of when they would happen. So we have an example here, um, and again, another example that's inspired from questions that you've submitted to the um, LTAC QRP help desk in the past uh, couple of years. So in this example, Mr. W is indentulous, so he does not have teeth, and his dentures no longer fit his gums. Um, he has several upper uh, joint contractures which impact his self, uh, fine motor skills. Mr. W uses a soft toothbrush to clean his lower gums and starts to clean his upper gums. The helper cleans the upper gums in the back and it is difficult uh, because it's difficult for Mr. W to reach. Mr. W rinses his mouth afterwards to complete the oral hygiene activity. So as you're thinking about the amount of help that Mr. W requires, so we would basically think about what is the patient doing, um, and does he need help? So in this instance, he does need help. And a second question that Carol um, provided you to think about was whether the person just needed setup or cleanup. For oral hygiene, something like setup, cleanup would be basically opening potentially a denture packet or opening uh, toothpaste. Um, or putting toothpaste on a toothbrush. In this case, the person is requiring more assistance than that. And so we basically go down and say, okay, is the person just providing verbal, the helper just providing verbal cueing or uh, touching assistance in some way? And in this case, the helper is actually doing more than that. So we would then basically say, okay, is the helper providing more than half of the effort or is the patient doing more than half of the effort. In this instance, as we think through what is described in the second bullet, it says that um, he is able to clean his, um, let's see, uh, Mr. W uses a soft uh, toothbrush to clean his lower gums and starts to clean his upper gums. The helper cleans the upper gums in the back. And then it also says that Mr. W rinses his mouth. So as you think about who's doing more effort, do you think the patient is doing more effort, which would be a code three, or is the helper doing more, which is a code two? A code one would be that the patient is totally dependent and the patient is definitely doing some in this uh, example. So if you can pull out your phones and think about um, the scenario, if you'd like to read it again, again, you can refer to your handouts. Um, so uh, the options are that you can code four, supervision, touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, code two, substantial assistance, and code one, dependent. And it looks we've got 95% coding 03, and I do agree with that. Um, in this case, the patient was doing more than half of the effort, but the helper was definitely doing a, a, some effort as part of the activity. So again, the rationale is provided here. So we have another scenario. In this case, um, this is a different type of situation. Um, as Carol mentioned, sometimes it may be, let's say, the occupational therapist is not actually assessing the patient um, because maybe the patient is able to perform the activity on the nursing care unit, and so the therapist might be asking um, one of the um, staff, direct care staff, 
uh, how much help the person needs. So this is a type of scenario where that's going on. So the occupational therapist says, does Mrs. K need help when brushing her teeth? And the certified nurse assistant in this case is the resource. And she says, yes, she needs help to clean her teeth. Um, we need more information in, in order to code. And so the occupational therapist then asks the follow-up question, how much help does she need to brush her teeth? And the certified nursing assistant says, she usually gets tired after starting to brush her teeth. I have to brush most of her teeth. So again, you'd think through, does the person need help? Yes, the patient does need help. Is it more than set up? Yes. Is it um, help where the patient is doing more than half of the effort? Or is the helper doing more than half of the effort? If the patient is doing more than half of the effort, you would code three. If the helper um, is doing more than half of the effort, the patient is doing less than half of the effort, you would code two. And then obviously, if the patient is dependent, you'd code one. In this case, the uh, CNA is telling the occupational therapist that um, I have to brush most of her teeth. So as you think about coding, uh, how would you code this example? Uh, options are four, supervision touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, code two, substantial maximal assistance, code one. It looks like we have 100% coding O2, and I do agree with that answer. So uh, there's a checkoff for code two, excellent. And there's the rationale. Okay, moving on to toileting hygiene. Um, in this case, um, toileting hygiene refers to the ability to maintain perineal hygiene, and that includes adjusting clothes before and after voiding or having a bowel movement. Um, if managing an ostomy, that would include uh, wiping the opening and not in managing of the equipment. Um, we did modify the definition. Again, um, a lot of the great questions that came in helped us understand that we're, there was some uh, questions about, for example, whether um, a patient can be coded for toileting hygiene if they um, had a bowel program in bed or if the person was incontinent. And for toileting hygiene, as I said, um, this is all basically about when somebody goes to the bathroom, either avoids or has a bowel movement, does the person need help managing their clothes? So pulling their pants down, pants and underwear down, um, cleansing, does the person need help? And then pulling pants back up. So there's basically three tasks within this activity, pants down, cleansing, and pants back up. And so certainly if somebody's incontinent, uh, certainly if somebody uses a bedpan or has a bowel program, those things would occur. Um, it might be a little bit more challenge if, if somebody's clothing is soiled or wet, or maybe somebody um, wears um, some um, clothing that's absorbent for, for urine. Um, and so still, again, managing clothing, wiping, and getting the clothing um, back up in place is, is the key. So in this case, um, we did clarify the definition to just focus on uh, managing clothing, the cleansing, after voiding or having a bowel movement. So we hope that this is more helpful um, to answer those kinds of questions. So um, again, toileting can happen if somebody uses a toilet, a commode, if the person is continent or continent, and if the person does even a bowel program in their bed. So we do have another example here. So this is case scenario five, if you're looking at your materials, because this is a bit of a longer explanation. Um, and so just for background, um, Ms. T has a progressive neurologic disease, and she wears up pull-up slacks and underwear. During toileting hygiene, Mrs. T prefers to be assisted while standing in front of her bathroom sink, so she likes to have something to hold on to. She steadies herself with one hand uh, on a grab bar and tries pulling down her pants and underwear with her other hand. So she's using one hand to hold on to things and uh, pulling her uh, starting to pull her pants down. She needs assistance from the helper to complete this part of the activity due to muscle weakness. So she's definitely needing some help already with you know, one component of this uh, toileting hygiene. Um, it says that she wipes herself uh, without assistance after urinating. So when she has um, 
when she voids, she's able to wipe herself. After a bowel movement, the certified nurse assistant performs peri perianal hygiene. The helper then pulls up Mrs. T's underwear and slacks. So one of the um, important points I wanted to emphasize about toileting hygiene that we um, identify in the manual is that if there's a difference in terms of toileting hygiene when somebody has a bowel movement versus when somebody voids, you would take the lower score. So in this case, we have the urine, um, uh, the voiding, where she basically is able to pull her pants down a little bit. Um, she's able to do the cleansing um, and uh, the helper pulls her pants back up. But it also says that when she has a bowel movement, actually the helper does the cleansing. And so that's gonna be the lower, more dependent um, situation for this Miss um, T. And so in this case, we think through what's happening with, with the toileting hygiene related to bowel management. So um, again, going back to Carol's questions, does she need help? Yes. Does she need just setup assistance? No. Does she need um, more than, does she need just touching assistance? No, she needs more than that. And so then we have to think through, um, does she provide more than half of the effort? Because she would, the patient, Ms. T, would be coded three if she's doing more than half of the effort. If she's doing less than half of the effort, she would be coded a two. And in this case, again, if we kind of think about this in three different tasks, uh, pulling her pants down, she does a little bit of that, but the helper also does some of it. The, uh, the um, helper is doing the, the hygiene, and then the helper is pull, pulling the pants back up. Um, so I will let you think through that in terms of coding. Uh, the options that you have if you um, enter these into your phone, uh, coding options are four, three, two, and one. And it looks like um, the consensus is the code is two, and I do agree with that. And so you see the check mark next to two. So again, you know, she's not dependent. I didn't have to go that far down in the decision tree because dependent, as Carol mentioned, is that the patient does um, not participate in the activity. So um, as part of the rationale, we have this little box, again, that kind of reinforces this information that if the person has differences in uh, their level of assistance uh, when they void or have a bowel movement, you will take the most dependent episode. Washing upper body is the next activity, and um, there were no changes to this, and we really don't get that many help desk questions about wash upper body, so um, we just wanted to offer a couple of coding tips, don't have a, an example here. But wash upper body uh, may be assist based on a sponge bath while the person is sitting in a chair or on the side of their bed, um, and it would include um, at the patient's bedside sink, a shower, or a tub. So anywhere that the upper body uh, washing is happening, uh, that's fine to do the assessment based on that. I want to move now to talk about goals. Um, and so I think everybody's familiar because this has been on the data set um, for several year now, years now. Um, there is the option to uh, report goals for each of the self-care items as well as the mobility items. And so um, discharge goals are only included on the admission assessment and it is the second column as you can see in um, highlighted here. Uh, just in terms of some guidance in ter terms of uh, Co uh, the coding of goals. Um, so there's lots of things that you would take into consideration. We have updated the guidance a little bit based on trying to be clearer, but it's essentially not changed. We're just, um, again, learning from your feedback, your questions on um, how to better convey this information. So basically, um, a licensed clinician can establish a patient's goals uh, for discharge at the time of admission based on the patient's prior uh, medical condition, their admission assessment in the areas of self-care and mobility, discussions with the patient and family, um, obviously professional judgment and professional uh, standards of practice are taken into consideration, as well as the patient's treatment plan, the patient's motivation, anticipated length of stay, and the patient's discharge plan. So goals should be co-created um, and established as part of the patient's care plan. 
And in terms of the um, LTAC quality reporting program, um, there is a requirement that you must report at least one goal. You're certainly welcome to report many more goals. Um, but again, there's a requirement for one goal in the area of self-care or mobility. So um, you can code the goals based on uh, the six-point rating scale that Carol reviewed. Um, new as part of the 2018 data set release, we are also allowing uh, the use of the activity not attempted codes 7, 9, 10, or 88. You may not be using those, uh, but again, they are there um, if you are interested in, in reporting those. Um, and again, uh, for the quality reporting program, a minimum of one is required. Use of a dash is permissible if you're not reporting, let's say, um, a goal for eating. You're reporting one, perhaps, for a mobility item. You can certainly put a dash in the um, self-care activity goals, and that does not affect your AP. Just in terms of um, Again, goals, um, we've had questions if the person is coded, let's say, an 88, the activity doesn't occur on admission, can you still report a goal? The answer is yes. Um, a goal may be submitted using the six-point um, rating scale, or maybe, you know, there is a continued um, um, thought that the person would not perform the activity at the time of discharge, and so the um, activity not a attempted codes could also be used. Um, if the patient is in uh, the uh, long-term care hospital for less than three days, um, please code one goal based on the person's anticipated care plan. Um, we know this doesn't happen very often, but we do get questions about this, and so I did want to address that today. Um, there are several examples in the slides of goals. Um, certainly, it is possible that a patient may be admitted um, and based on the treatment plan, the person is expected to have improvement during their stay. And so the, in that case, the discharge goal would be higher than the admission. And so um, there's an example here. Mr. M prefers to brush his own teeth, uh, but at admission, he needs help, and more than half of the effort is needed due to upper extremity weakness. So in this case, he would be coded a two on admission. And let's say by discharge, the expectation is that he will um, be able to improve function and be able to um, basically uh, only require partial moderate assistance, which would be a code three. So that's a, a higher uh, score anticipated. It's also possible that the um, goal is to maintain function. So we have an example here where somebody has um, severe tremors due to Parkinson's disease and um, he um, has multiple limitations, and so the clinician observes him on admission and determines that he needs substantial maximal assistance. And by discharge, the expectation is that he maintained this level of function, and so he's coded a two also um, at, um, for a goal. And then it is also possible that um, somebody who has a progressive neurologic illness may be in the facility for some time, and um, maybe um, the person is, is expected to actually lose function. So in this case, um, we actually have an example um, with somebody who on admission is coded partial moderate assistance, and by discharge, um, the person um, is not expected to improve. The person is expected to um, decline because of their um, condition, and so they're coded O2 substantial maximal assistance. Okay, so I'm going to move now to mobility. So um, there are more mobility items in self-care. We have a few examples. Um, so again, um, I would refer you to your handout as we go through the scenarios, and please do um, have your phone handy to provide um, your um, responses. So in terms of mobility, um, again, um, it, there are uh, coding on admission and also a discharge. There's um, on the admission assessment, the goals are also reported. So we just talked about goals. The same rules apply for mo mobility that applied for self-care. And on the um, mobility, you'll also see that there's some follow-up questions related to the um, wheelchair mobility items because we're interested in the type of wheelchair that was used or the, if a scooter was used. 
So these remain as they were on the prior data set. Um, in terms of steps for assessment, Carol did a great job covering this for self-care, and so I'm not going to take the time to go over these again. Again, um, we have provided some updates uh, based on the feedback from questions to try and clarify, but the um, essentials are the same. It's a multidisciplinary approach um, to assessing, and you take into account um, on admission, the intent is to get a baseline assessment and discharge its person status at the end of their stay. So moving right into the items then. Um, so the, um, the first item is roll left and right. Um, and so this is simply the ability to roll from lying on the back to the left and to the right side and return to being on the back uh, in the bed. So we did clarify, um, again, based on questions, again, it's uh, getting back on the bed. So that's why that's highlighted. That is a slight modification to the definition. So um, some of the questions that we've had about bed mobility we thought were really good and wanted to share um, some points with you at this point. Um, so if the clinician determines that the patient's medical need requires a patient to sit upright, um, rather than a slightly elevated position. It is really hard to assess some of these bed mobility items, and so you can certainly code those 88 not attempted due to medical concern or safety. So it's gonna be a judgment call on your part in terms of whether you can really assess these items or not. So we, we do get a fair number of questions, both um, from ERFs and LTACs on this particular issue, so um, certainly your judgment in terms of whether you could do the assessment depending on how elevated um, the head of the bed is. If the uh, patient's head of the bed only needs to be slightly elevated, the clinician can assess the patient's bed mobility activities and should be coded um, using this, uh, the rating scale that Carol um, provided uh, details on. So we do have a scenario here. This is um, scenario six. And um, so Mr. R experienced a stroke, and he is also obese. The nurse instructs him to turn onto his side, providing step-to-step -step instructions to use the bed rail, bend his left leg, and then roll onto his right side. The nurse asks another staff member for assistance. The patient places his hand on the bed rail and provides a small amount of help as the two nurses roll him onto his right side. Next, the patient is instructed to return to lying on his back, which he cannot complete, and the clinicians provide the necessary assistance. Mr. R then requires physical assistance from the nurses to roll uh, onto his left side and to return to lying on his back in the bed to complete the activity. So one of the things I'm going to turn back to the questions that Carol um, provided you to think through when you're coding. Um, and so one of the things that you'll notice when you're um, uh, looking at those questions is that when it asks about assistance, it's asked whether assistance is being provided by one helper. And so if you follow the, um, the uh, questions, it basically talks about the patient uh, providing more than half of the um, effort or less than half the effort with only one helper. So if you actually follow the logic tree down, uh, basically, you know, in this case, the person obviously is quite dependent, so I'll skip down to level two. Um, it says, basically, is the person providing any, you know, uh, amount of, of effort with the assistance of only one person? And if the answer is no, that's actually going to um, tell you to go to code one. So anytime the patient requires the assistance of two helpers, it's always going to be coded one. And that includes the instance where, similar to this, the patient is providing a little bit of effort or, you know, a, some of the effort. Um, when you have two helpers, it's automatically a code one. So I will go through uh, the scenario uh, just uh, uh, to have you just kind of go through the process. But um, again, if you, um, let me just, so in this scenario, there was two helpers required, and uh, so you are all getting that correct, so thank you for listening. Um, so uh, exactly right, code one is, is the rationale because there's two helpers involved. Okay, the next example, um, 
or the next uh, item, I apologize, next item is uh, sit to lying. So in this case, uh, it's the ability to move from sitting on the side of the bed to lying on the side, of, uh, flat on the bed. Um, the next bed mobility item is lying to sitting on side of bed, and this is um, basically um, starting in the lying position and getting uh, sitting upright, sitting on the side of the bed with feet flat on the floor with um, no back support. We do have an example here to go through together. So in this case, it's Miss P has a chronic respiratory condition and a swallowing disorder due to a recent stroke. A medical order requires the head of her bed to be slightly elevated and serves as a lying position required for Miss P. To transition Miss P from lying to the sitting position, the CNA lifts and swivels Miss P's legs over the edge of the bed while supporting and lifting her trunk. Miss P assists with scooting herself forward towards the edge of the bed and balances herself while sitting at the edge of the bed with her feet on the floor. So as we kind of walk through um, those coding questions, so she does need help, Ms. P does need help. It's more than just setup. It is more than just verbal cueing or touching assistance. Um, in this case, you know, uh, the patient only has one helper and she is providing a little bit of assistance. So we have to kind of think through, I think, is it level three or is it level two? Again, level three, the patient is performing more than half of the effort. At level two, the patient is performing less than half of the effort. So as we think through this, it says that the CNA lifts and swivels Miss P's legs over the edge of the bed. So she's helping to lift her um, to get to a sitting position, and she's also lifting the patient's legs and helping to swivel them um, over the side of the bed and what the patient is doing is basically scooting forward in the bed and so um, in this case you have to think through who's performing more than half of the effort if you think that the patient is doing more than half of the effort you would code a three if it's less than half of the effort you would code a two so I've narrowed it down a little bit um, so if you don't mind putting on your phones the response that you're thinking might be right for this particular patient. Okay, looks like uh, everybody coded number two, and I do agree with that in this case. There was a fair amount of help that was provided by the helper, so the patient was doing less than half of the effort. Okay, the next um, item is sit to stand, um, and this is the ability to come to a standing position from sitting in a chair, wheelchair, or side of the bed. So we have uh, practice uh, coding scenario eight here. Um, Mr. M has severe emphysema and pneumonia. The nurse reminds him to lock his brakes and swivel, swing his legs, uh, leg rests aside before standing up. Mr. M places his hands on the wheelchair arm, rests um, and attempts to stand, but struggles with labored breathing and weakness. The nurse uses a gait belt to assist Mr. M as he starts to rise from the sitting to standing position. So there is lifting assistance. And Mr. M completes the activity by supporting himself and performing more than half of the effort. So again, as you think through those questions, I'll let you kind of think through those questions on your own this time. Um, the, um, again, you know, the, what's the patient doing? What's the helper doing? So I'll let you put your answers in. All right, it looks like 94% uh, are coding three, and that is indeed the correct answer. Um, the patient contributes more than half of the effort. Okay, moving on to transfer. So the first transfer item is a bed, um, bed to chair transfer, and this refers to the ability to get from uh, a bed to a chair or perhaps to a wheelchair. And the next item is toilet transfer. We don't get a lot of questions about uh, the transfer items. Um, toilet transfer is the ability to get on and off a toilet or commode. Um, we do have a scenario here. Um, and so in this case, um, Mr. F has no urine output due to chronic renal failure, and he uses a bedpan for bowel movements. 
At this time, he does not transfer onto a toilet or commode, but his discharge goal is to transfer onto a toilet with steady assistance from a helper, which is the same level of assistance he needed prior to the current episode of care. So in this case, this is the admission assessment, and so the first bullet is really the key information that you need for coding. And basically it says that um, he's had um, uh, um, chronic renal failure, so he hasn't gone off and off on and off a toilet um, for voiding, and in this case he now uses a bedpan for bowel movements. So um, what do you think about coding? So the activity didn't occur, and so you have a couple of options uh, related to how to code this particular example. So code options are two, uh, nine not actable, 10, or 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. Okay, looks like most people coded 88. Okay, and um, I do agree with that. Um, if, if it had said that he had used a bedpan, uh, you know, prior to his current illness, exacerbation or injury, then I think a nine would have been appropriate because he didn't do it prior to the current illness, exacerbation or injury. But um, it didn't say that, so he would have been getting on and off a toilet for bowel movements prior to admission, and so code 88 would be appropriate in this example. Okay, we have um, walking. So in this case, um, uh, the first walking item is walking 10 feet. Um, once standing, that uh, is when you begin the assessment, and it is the ability to walk 10 feet in a room, corridor, or similar place. Um, as Carol mentioned, there is a skip pattern, so if the person is not walking 10 feet, then we know they would not be walking the 50 feet, the longer distances. So here we have an example. Um, Mrs. C has not walked during the past three weeks due to our recent leg uh, weakness and fatigue. So in this case, it's um, let's say that she got admitted to acute care three weeks ago, and so basically prior to the current illness, exasperation, or injury, she was walking, but in the past uh, three weeks while she's been in acute care, um, she has not been able to walk due to the weakness and fatigue. The physical therapist determines that it is unsafe for her to walk on the um, unit using her walker um, at the time of admission. And so at this point, they are working on walking in parallel bars. And one thing that we've had questions about that um, I wanted to bring up in this example is that um, equipment such as parallel bars that are not portable uh, would not uh, be considered actually when you're doing an assessment for walking. And so basically um, the, the issue is whether this person is able to walk on the unit uh, without parallel bars or perhaps walk in therapy. And in this case it says that she does not walk. And so um, how would you code uh, this particular person? So if you can enter that on your phone. Great. Okay, it looks like um, most people are coding 88 um, to indicate that uh, it's a medical concern um, or safety. And so that is correct. The activity of walking didn't occur because we wouldn't consider walking in parallel bars as part of the assessment for walking 10 feet, since the parallel bars are not portable. And so it's, it doesn't represent what somebody could do on the nursing unit. Okay, the next activity is walking 50 feet with two turns, and then again, this begins once the person is starting in a standing position, and it's the ability to walk 50 feet while making two turns. So we do have a scenario here. When Ms. B was admitted to the LTAC, she walked using parallel bars during her session with the physical therapist. Mrs. B's therapist determined that it was not safe for her to use the walker at the time of admission. But we are now coding discharge for Ms. B. So Ms. B has progressed in therapy. Upon discharge, Mrs. B walks 50 feet with two turns using her walker while her therapist provides steadying, touching assistance once a day. One of the things that we wanted to kind of make this example a little bit hard for you, um, and we'll walk through this together, but we wanted to address the issue of usual status. So in this case, on the LTAC unit, 
Mrs. B uses her walker when ambulating once in the morning and a few times in the afternoon, and she needs more uh, help, helper support due to fatigue. On the unit, the nurse provides less than half of the effort um, in terms of trunk uh, support assistance. The nurse provides less than half of the effort when Ms. B walks 50 feet with two turns while using her walker. So in this case, we have in therapy, the um, therapist provides just steadying assistance, but we learn, um, which would be coded four. Um, and then in the third bullet, we learned that she does walk several times on the, um, the nurse and care unit, the LTAC unit, and that she does, you know, the uh, nurses are allowing her to be as independent as possible uh, when she walks, but the patient has legitimate um, medical assistant needs due to her fatigue. And so in this case, the nurse provides uh, more support, trunk support, so it's more than touching, um, but the nurse provides less than half of the effort. And so when we're thinking about usual, we would think that, you know, well, in therapy she is doing quite well, but on, um, you know, more commonly or more usually, she actually is needing more assistance on the care unit. And so that more uh, is, is what we're interested in. So um, as Carol mentioned, usual, we don't want uh, the fact that somebody did something once, their best performance or their worst performance, but what is their typical or usual performance? And so in this case, it would be what's happening on the nursing unit. So how would you code um, uh, this patient? So the options that you can enter in your phone are code four, touching uh, supervision assistance, uh, level three partial moderate assistance, code two substantial maximal assistance, or code one dependent. And it looks like 100% of people coded three, and I do agree with that. And so uh, you will see the check mark next to three. And again, the rationale is that her usual performance is what we observe on the nursing care unit. And certainly, you know, it's important, I think, as part of the assessment that the therapists and nurses are talking so that the therapist understands that the patient may not be able to perform at the same level maybe that she observed in therapy due to either fatigue or perhaps somebody has more difficulty in the morning due to arthritis or, or other medical conditions. Okay, the next item is walking 150 feet. Um, and again, this is um, the assessment begins once the person is in a standing position, and it's the ability to walk 150 feet in a corridor or similar place. Um, the, the next few slides are focused on the wheelchair items. Um, I guess the most important thing I'd like to convey based on the help desk questions that we get about the wheelchair items is that if the patient is only being transported, let's say, to um, a test or maybe to therapy or a, a, maybe a dining room area or a cafeteria um, at the facility, um, that would not be considered as using a wheelchair. The intent is people um, would be coded on wheelchair if they're actually using a wheelchair to move themselves around. And so um, if the person is only using um, a wheelchair to, and is being pushed because they're going again for CAT scan or, or some other test like that, um, you, would, you can code that the person does not use a wheelchair and then you would be able to skip out of all of the wheelchair items. So there's an item about wheeling 50 feet with two turns, um, which is parallel to the walking item. Um, again, there's a follow-up question about the type of wheelchair, whether it's a manual wheelchair or a motorized uh, wheelchair or scooter. Um, there's a, another question about the um, ability of the patient to wheel 150 feet, and again, a follow-up question about the type of wheelchair. Um, I previously talked about the goals related to self-care. The same uh, guidance applies to the mobility items. Um, again, uh, you need to code at least one self-care or mobility item. Uh, you can code the six-point rating scale um, with the 2018 data set, um, LTAC version, LTAC care data set version 4.0. You may also code 7, 9, 10, or 88. We don't think that these will be commonly used, but certainly those are an option now if you'd like to use those. 
So I'd like to wrap up the presentation talking about the um, functional outcome measures. So um, I believe that you are aware that the reason that CMS added the function items onto the data set, the LTAC care data set, is because they finalized through rulemaking the um, quality measures of uh, a process measure related to function, and then also a functional outcome measure related to patients who um, require ventilator support and looking at their mobility uh, improvement between admission and discharge. So I wanted to um, talk through a little bit about the reports and the data that you'll see related to the quality measure. Uh, tomorrow there's a presentation that goes through the whole public reporting and talks about the different types of report in more detail. But I did want to, um, again, walk through just the type of information that you'll see related to the data that's being collect collected in Section GG, um, the self-care and mobility items. So um, as part of this presentation, my goal is to um, identify be sure that by the end of this presentation, you're able to identify the key components of a quality measure. So we've talked about items, but there's many other things that go into uh, calculating a quality measure. So I wanted to highlight those for you. Um, I wanted to be sure that you were able to know um, where there are resources if you're interested in learning more about these quality measures. So actually, I have a couple of slides with uh, links. Um, there's actually a lot of details, and I don't expect you to learn all of it, but again, want to be sure you know the general gist of how the measure is calculated and where to go to find more information. And then finally, um, I hope that um, following this presentation, you'll be able to interpret the function quality measure data that's displayed on your review and correct report and your quality measure report. So again, the, starting with the components of a quality measure. So there are data elements. So the data that are being submitted on the LTAC care data set, version 3.0 now and version 3.0 starting July 1, 2018. Um, so that's one component. Um, as part of a quality measure, we also define the target population. And so um, part of what you can find in the resources I'll be describing is how that is operationalized. So how does, when Medicare is calculating these quality measures, how is the target uh, population defined? There are also exclusion criteria for many quality measures, including the LTAC outcome measure. And so I'll review in general that information with you. There are a lot of details, but again, um, want to be sure you know the resources to look for that detail. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the risk adjustment approach. I won't get too technical, but just again, provide you with information so that you can look at that um, a little bit more in detail if you're interested or with your colleagues. Talk a little bit about the calculation uh, process or the calculation algorithm and talk about the reporting period. So the key document that um, I want to be sure you're aware of is the um, what we call the uh, Long-Term Care Hospital Quality Reporting Program Measure Calculation and Reporter QM Users Manual. Um, version 2.0 is the current manual that's posted on the LTAC QRP website, and this is the direct link. Um, as you can see, it has the date of June 28, uh, 2017. There will be a new uh, document posted uh, later this year, so I will provide you a link in a later slide that kind of tells you the website, but this is the current document, and certainly I would encourage you to, to look at this document for a lot of the details that I'm going to present in the next few slides. So um, in the QM user's manual, just so you have an idea, there are definitions in there because there's a lot of technical information, and we know it's very hard to know um, all of the technical details, and so there's um, key terminology to find. There's links to information actually about the CDC, uh, National Healthcare Safety, NHSN, uh, quality measures. There's information about the claims data. Uh, there's also information about how patient stay records are selected so that CMS can calculate the assessment-based quality measures. The logic of the specifications are provided. And then as part of risk adjustment, there are coefficients and um, intercepts that are used. And so that's what um, we refer to as the model parameters. 
So, um, if you would, whoop, sorry. If you would like to look at um, this slide, basically this is um, what a, this is sample, it's not real data, um, but this is what a review and correct report looks like. And so you can see that there's information about a facility here that's made up. So this is the sample long-term care hospital. And what you find here is also information um, about the results. So you first of all have the reporting quarter, so data each row represents one quarter of data. Uh, there's a start date and an end date for the data collection, and that is one quarter's worth of time. You'll see the bottom row actually is a whole calendar year of data. Um, there is a um, correction uh, deadline here, uh, because as I believe you are aware, uh, the data are submitted um, based on the time frame that was discussed earlier, if you notice that there are errors in the data, there are an opportunity to correct. And so perhaps you might be looking at some of these reports and realize that there were actually some errors. And so in this case, um, you can actually see that it tells you in this report that the um, correction time frame is open, or as we go further back in time, the time frames are closed. On this, uh, report, you'll also see the number of eligible patients discharged for your LTAC and your LTAC's average observed change in mobility score. So on the next slide, I'm actually going to talk about these two data points so that you know exactly what those are. So the first uh, column that I mentioned there, um, let me just go back. So the this first column is on the next slide. So the number of eligible patients discharged from your LTAC during the reporting time period is the number of, of patient stays that were included. Uh, the patient records are selected based on discharge dates. So for example, if we if in that uh, row that says quarter one 2018, that would be patients discharged January 1 to 2018 to March 31, 2018. So it's, again, based on the discharge date. So not based on admission date, but based on the discharge date. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is that if um, uh, a patient perhaps uh, has a stay in your LTAC and then um, leaves and it is not a program interruption, but they have a completely separate stay perhaps a month later, um, then uh, each record uh, stay is included. So the a pa individual patient may be included more than once in a quarter in that instance. The next data point that's on that report is your um, LTAX average observed change in mobility score. And here, um, this is the number, uh, or this number represents the average change in mobility score between admission and discharge for all included patients discharged during the observation during the re reporting period. I do want to differentiate the word observed here, means that this is the actual data that was submitted, so the actual difference. And that means it has not been risk adjusted. So you'll see on the report we sometimes refer to observed change, and then we, in other columns, refer to the risk adjusted. So it's either observed or it's risk adjusted. I want to walk through quickly just in terms of the calculation. Again, all of these details are in, in much greater detail reported in the QM user's manual that I provided you the link to. Um, but basically, the process that we, uh, CMS, uses to calculate the measure um, is to calculate the admission mobility score, which is adding up the scores after activity not attempted codes are recoded to one. And so every um, Every mobility item would be coded between 1 and 6 when things are recoded, and so those numbers are added together, summed together for at admission. The discharge data are summed together for a discharge mobility score. Uh, the uh, next step is to identify excluded stays, identify the included stays, calculate the difference between the um, uh, discharge and admission, which is the observed change in mobility score uh, for each person. And then the facility average is calculated for that reporting period. So it could be a quarter, it could be a year, if you're looking at that bottom row of the review and correct report. And the value is rounded to one decimal place. 
I won't go into detail, but there are very specific exclusion criteria. All the details are here, and it tells you in the QM user's manual exactly what items. So if I tell you um, a patient discharge to acute care is included, you can see that we look at item A2, um, uh, 2110 and a code of five is how we identified that. So if you're coding that correctly, uh, we're able to identify those patients correctly. Length of stay is calculated as discharge date minus admission date, and if that difference is uh, less than three days, the person, uh, that record is excluded from the um, calculation. Uh, there are also criteria related to age, hospice, coma. Again, um, you know, these are all details um, that are in the QM users man, just wanted to give you an idea. Uh, patients with progressive neurologic conditions are excluded also. Um, also patients who are completely independent with all activities on admission are excluded. Um, this doesn't happen often, but it is a criteria. Next, I wanted to move to the QM uh, report, the quality measure report. And again, um, in this particular row, you'll see that there's um, measure ID number, there's a denominator, an admission score, a discharge score, an observed change. Uh, this, is, this is calculated based on the patient level data, and so it may not be exactly the same uh, mathematically as the difference here because it's calculated at the patient level and then averaged at the facility level. So the denominator, it's the number of LTAC patients um, with um, that are included in the calculation after the exclusion criteria are applied. Um, again, the average admission score is across all the patients, average disc score, discharge score across all patients. Uh, the observed change score, again, is the actual data. And then the risk-adjusted data is where we have taken into account in the calculation that your patients may be sicker than other patients. And so the, um, there is a calculation of an expected score and a ratio of the observed to expected score in order to come up with a risk-adjusted value. And then there's a national comparison score, and that national comparison average can be compared to your risk-adjusted score. So, you know, with the risk-adjusted score, we've leveled the playing field so that it can be compared to this national average that's reported on the report. Again, just want to emphasize um, the QM user's manual has tons of details about this. We certainly welcome any questions uh, today or on the help desk in the future about the calculation of the measures. Um, so the current QM user's manual is that first link. And then um, in the future, if you're looking for updates, you can go to the general website to find it there. In summary, um, Section GG includes items that assess need for assistance related to self-care and mobility. Um, what I presented today was information about the changes, and Carol also provided that information. Carol gave um, coding instructions, the practice scenarios were covered in this part, and also gave you an overview of the uh, quality measure results. Um, in terms of action plan, um, so when you go back to your facility, again, re review the items in this section. Uh, changes, um, again, uh, none of the item definitions result in changes, but they are good clarifications, I think, to help reinforce correct coding. And uh, we hope that you will start to look at your reports, and again, there'll be information tomorrow um, about uh, the um, uh, public reporting in general, uh, Tree Lee will be covering that.